Yeah, really excited to be here today talking about DevOps for machine learning and uh, the process and the, and the best practices and everything that goes around it, uh, around the actual machine learning core itself. Uh, so give a really good introduction already. Uh, so the one thing I'll just add is that, uh, fun fact, the last time I was here in Toronto was 10 years ago uh, when I was in grad school presenting at an AI conference uh, way back before it was cool. Uh, and so really excited to be back and, and uh, hope to, to continue coming to future conferences here. So the core of this talk and, and really the question that I want you to ask yourself and think about is how do I deploy machine learning? Uh, there's a lot of possible ways that you can do this, uh, and I'm not going to try to convince that there's any one right way to do this uh, in this talk, but just thinking about the question of, you know, if you were to be starting a hackathon project over the weekend, or founding a company, or designing the machine learning infrastructure for a large company, uh, there's a question of how to actually design this, this life cycle, this system uh, for getting machine learning into production. And the key word there is production. Uh, that's the track we're in at this talk. Uh, and there's a huge difference between uh, you know, an ML project in the lab uh, or, or an experiment and actually getting that out into production. Uh, a huge number of projects fail because they fail to reach production. We've been hearing that over and over at the talks today. Uh, and so the question is, is how can we improve that? How can we actually make it so that you know, this, this machine learning and this great work that this, the data scientists and machine learning engineers are doing actually gets into products and into the hands of people who can benefit from it? So the way that I like to think about this is by analogy with traditional software, by which I mean REST APIs, web services, uh, you know, things like that, the, the kinds of software that we've been building for the last 10, 20 years. Uh, and the best practices and things like that that we've learned over those last 10 to 20 years uh, of building software and how we can apply those to machine learning. So the software, uh, the software development life cycle can be defined in a number of ways. Uh, there's a couple things which are pretty common that you'll see at realistically any business or in almost any project. And again, we're not talking about ML here. We're talking about traditional software. Uh, Always going to see Git, you know, CI, CD, uh, using you know Jenkins, Git, GitHub, GitLab, things like that to deploy your code automatically, run tests, things like that, uh, and then you know the, the the stuff that happens after you write the code and after it gets deployed, monitoring, logging, alerting, those sorts of things. These are table stakes on traditional software. And if you were to go out and you know try to start a company or start a new project, and you said to your investors or your boss, you know, hey, I don't think I'm going to use source control. I'm not going to use Git. I don't I don't want to use CI. CD, I'm just going to wing it. Uh, I mean, you get laughed out of the room. But in machine learning, it's actually pretty uncommon to see those sorts of things. And it's incredibly common to see people training models on their laptop using Jupyter Notebook, not even source controlling you know, what they're doing or being able to see the history of how they got to where they got. Uh, and so I think that you know, we can learn from this, and we can apply some of these same concepts from traditional software development lifecycle to the machine learning lifecycle. So we'll dive into kind of all of these a little bit more deeply, but just trying to think uh, to ourselves, like, what would be an analogy for each of these sorts of uh, staples of traditional software development if you wanted to transfer them to the world of machine learning? That's a question we ask ourselves at Algorithmia a lot of, you know, what would CI for AI look like? Uh, what are the unique constraints? You know, why wouldn't you just want to use something like a Jenkins or a GitLab? Or what would you need to do if you wanted to do that? Um, and there's, there's some other qualitative differences of machine learning which you would want to adapt if you wanted to uh, bring some of these best practices into that world. So it's not a perfect analogy. There are differences in how machine learning is done versus how traditional software is developed. Uh, and so what I'm, the, a big part that I'm trying to emphasize here is that there's a cycle. Uh, and it's not just about the code that you write. It's about the code plus the data. Uh, so that introduces some additional complexities and some additional sort of uh, links in the software development lifecycle uh, that, that comes up. Uh, but the key here is really focusing on the cycle and, and the additional steps that, that come into play as you're doing this. So mostly an excuse to put cool picture up, but uh, actually even going back to the 1950s, uh, people recognized that uh, there's General Boyd who was studying 
uh, dogfighting fighter jets, and he recognized that the speed of iteration is more important than the quality of iteration. Uh, this sounds pretty obvious to a lot of people in this room. It underpins the, you know, a lot of software development, agile, uh, you know, testing and, and failing early and often. Uh, but you know, this is a really important concept, and it's especially concept in, uh, especially important in machine learning, where we're going to have this constant flow of new data, where there's going to be retraining. Uh, the iteration speed can, in many cases, be much faster than in traditional software. Uh, so let's break down the phases of the machine learning life cycle and look a little bit more deeply into each one of them. So there, it, it's not usually just going to be one monolithic system. It's going to be a combination of a number of parts that go into it. And there's very different characteristics in each of these phases. So it makes sense to choose the best tools for each part of the job. Uh, I think that it's unlikely that there's going to be one end-to-end uh, -end solution that solves everything uh, for machine learning, everything from the data to the training to the deployment to the management. Uh, if you, again, just by analogy, look at traditional software, there's not a lot of examples of end-to-end, be-all, end-all solutions that people just use. People use GitHub plus you know, AWS or Heroku plus uh, you know, other monitoring solutions. So I think some people think that there's going to be you know, this, this whole integrated solution for ML, but I actually think that's not the direction that things go, because you end up wanting to choose the best possible tool for each phase of the job, for each part of the job. And the bigger the project and the bigger the budgets, the more that becomes the case. So I'm not going to talk too much about data. There's a ton to be said, but it is outside of the scope of this talk. Uh, but the really important thing to recognize is that Algorithms, machine learning without data is generally not going to be useful. So you need to think as you're designing your life cycle and your, your DevOps systems and, and, all, and data systems that you need to be able to integrate your machine learning in whatever form that is. Sometimes that's, sometimes that's a Jupyter notebook or, or, or a framework. You need to be able to connect into your data often during, always during training, really, and often during production as well, not just the data that's processing through. So training has some fairly distinct characteristics that make it different than uh, maybe traditional software. And one of the big changes is, challenges is that it typically happens once. I'm going to wave my hands a little bit there. But you know, there's retraining and things like that. But in the early stages of machine learning, uh, the training is often going to be done by a single person, sometimes on their laptop, usually in an interactive environment, because it's exploratory. Uh, I, Stateful isn't exactly like the right word here, but it's, uh, it's not something that you scale horizontally. Uh, and that results in very distinct uh, sort of characteristics from more traditional software where what you care about is scaling horizontally. Doing inference is largely going to be stateless. So you, you can just blindly spread it out across the many machines or even across the globe, and it'll work. So you want different tools and different approaches to each of these two phases. So spent some time thinking about you know, how do you actually go from training uh, into deployment after you've built your model. This is a place where a lot of failures of machine learning uh, into, uh, happen, where you'll have a data scientist or a machine learning engineer. Uh, you know, they worked really hard to do the feature engineering, clean the data, uh, you know, explore the different models and architectures, tune the weights, all those things. And you know, they come back and they say, hey, isn't this great? I have this model that has you know, 90 plus percent whatever accuracy accuracy. Uh, but if you don't have a way of getting that into production and into integrated into products, uh, it's, it's just a science experiment. It's not actually going to be useful. Um, so one of the things that uh, we've talked about uh, at Algorithmia a lot is like, how do you make that flow from training into deployment as seamless as possible? Uh, and also addressing some of those best practice things that I was saying. So one thing that I think is a possible best practice is uh, having two Git repos, one for inference and one for training, uh, and being able to track those code bases. Because you don't want to just have, be passing around Jupyter notebooks on your local hard drive or in email in some cases. You want to have a record of these things. Uh, and you want to, and fundamentally, the code that you use for training isn't going to be used in inference. So they are, in a certain sense, different code bases. They might live together, but you want to think about them separately in a certain sense. And Going back to the sort of CI and, and event-driven thinking of things, uh, 
it's possible to do things like at the bottom of your Jupyter notebook or at the end of your training code. Uh, just to have a little snippet, and it could be you know, a script or whatever. It takes your model, uh, can do some validation. It can do things like hashing to have uh, authentication of the models uh, so you know that the model uh, generated by this code is the model that you're running in production. And essentially just push that out to whatever your deployment platform is. Uh, so this is just one possible way to do it, but it, it kind of goes along with the, the idea of traditional software using event-driven and, and having these pipelines of, of, of things that happen after you push the code to run automa in, automatically instead of having to do things manually. So there's a couple also unique uh, challenges that come with deployment. Uh, not the least of which is going to be things like specialized hardware. Uh, if you're not using GPUs or, or in the future, you know, ASICs and TPUs and things like that, uh, your machine learning is not going to be running as fast as it could. And if performance is, it matters, then you're definitely going to want to use things like GPUs, which are currently mostly the way things are done in practice. There's a problem with that, though, when it comes to machine learning and why you can't necessarily use the same tools that you use with traditional software as you do for machine learning. So people. You know, containerization has, has changed the way that people think about DevOps, uh, but there's a problem with that when it comes into the world of machine learning. And people like to think of Docker as kind of just a very lightweight, very fast VM, but it's not, actually. Uh, all the Docker containers on a given machine are going to be sharing the same kernel. And so when you're in a world of machine learning and you need to use you know, NVIDIA GPUs that have NVIDIA drivers which live in the kernel, that abstraction of Docker breaks down, and suddenly it's not acting like an isolated component, you have to think about the hardware and the kernel and, and the shared environment that these containers are running in. Uh, this is complicated by the layers of abstraction that have been built up in order to do what we do today with machine learning. Uh, you know, at the bottommost layer is the NVIDIA drivers. Uh, there's CUDA built up on top of that, and then you know, the, the languages and frameworks that you use there. Uh, if you're trying to run Docker containers uh, for, for machine learning and for, to run an API, uh, the CUDA version has to match inside the Docker container and outside of the Docker container. Uh, this leads to a lot of challenges and prevents a lot of uh, deployment systems from being usable, actually, if you wanted to be you know, turning your machine learning into an API or whatever. Uh, composability is another really important thing to consider uh, in machine learning that's a little bit unique uh, to this world. Uh, a lot of machine learning systems, and this is especially true in natural language processing, uh, is going to be composed of multiple blocks. Uh, so, you know, a very common uh, example would be uh, vectorizing your, your inputs before you pass it into some other algorithm. Um, over time, these are starting to integrate, but if you build a really good, you know, NLP processing system in one framework, uh, but you have, you know, a different, different framework, you know, TensorFlow versus PyTorch or versus whatever, uh, then, sorry, then uh, combining them can be difficult. Uh, companies want to standardize on things, but in a field that's evolving as quickly as machine learning is, it can be really hard to standardize when, you know, just last year, you know, TensorFlow was the tool that everybody would go to. Uh, PyTorch was barely even 1.0. And now you look at the statistics, and you know, the majority of research is happening in PyTorch. And I, I would imagine it's quickly catching up in business. So you want to give flexibility to your data scientists and your machine learning engineers to use the best tool for the job and make sure that you can combine them and, and pipeline them. Um, so finally, management. Uh, what are the things you want to do after you deploy a machine learning model? Uh, and again, by analogy with traditional software, there's a number of things you want to do, such as logging, alerting, uh, monitoring. Uh, but checking things like uh, accuracy, uh, think drawing an analogy to unit tests and integration tests with traditional software, it's a little bit different uh, in the world of machine learning because, well, a unit test for you know, a, an API or whatever might if it passes, it's probably going to pass forever going into the, the future. But in the world of machine learning, it depends not just on the code that you wrote, uh, but also the data and the, the distribution of the inputs that you're feeding into it. So you have to watch for things like model drift. So you might have built uh, you know, clothing or fashion recognition model that worked great in the summer. And then uh, a couple months later, winter comes around. The training set is not the same as your, input, as your, as your data distribution now, and so it fails. So you don't want to just run tests when you push new code. You want to run tests continually or on a periodic basis. 
uh, in order to be able to detect these kinds of uh, regressions that don't necessarily exist in traditional software. So what are some of the problems that we've seen creep in uh, in organizations and when people are trying to productionize AI? Uh, a really common one that we see is having the right teams. Uh, in many cases, uh, a company will hire up a team of, of data scientists and machine learning engineers, and they'll go off, you know, they'll, they'll find some data, they'll do the work of a data scientist, you know, feature engineering, cleaning, building the model, come back with a good, accurate model. And then the question is, who's responsible for deploying that and scaling it and maintaining it and supporting it? And it's a very different task than, than data science. Data, you know, uh, spend years learning the art of training models and, and evaluating all this stuff is a very different task than, than an, you know, an engineer, a DevOps engineer in many cases, who has spent their career learning how to make systems that are reliable and scalable and performant. And so figuring out what is that boundary? How do you, how do you handle that? Is there a handoff? Because, or do you just ask the data scientist to be responsible for you know, creating an API for their own work? Uh, there's no right or wrong answer. There, there's going to be pros and cons of any of these approaches, but it's something to think about as, you, as you're designing this. Uh, and as you're thinking about this, uh, so it's a fairly famous law, Conway's law, uh, organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the, or communication structures of these organizations. Said sim more simply, if you have different organizations, you know, if you have your data scientists and your DevOps and the, that's the structure of your organization, your technology that you build is going to reflect that. And that could be for better or for worse. So it's something to think about as you're designing your data pipelines and systems. Uh, Google uh, published this this year, uh, hidden t technical debt in machine learning. And really the takeaway is that building models is often the, the, the easier part. Um, not always, but it's, uh, it's, it's just one part of a much larger uh, effort that's required in order to successfully deploy and maintain and get value out of machine learning systems. Highly recommended. Uh, so ML is in a huge growth phase, uh, which is awesome. There's a ton of interest in it. Uh, we're seeing the number of people at conferences increase massively and funding increase massively, which is great for the field. Uh, but DevOps hasn't been keeping up. And that's really kind of the point that I want to keep hammering on is, you know, we can do a lot better in the DevOps world when it comes to machine learning. And there's, you know, we've been talking about the challenges, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, the, the behavior that you want to be able to support for this uh, that is standard for things like APIs is really difficult, again, for machine learning. Uh, you might have models that put out that need to handle 1,000 calls a second for a little while and then scale down. Uh, that you might also have ones that have very, very long loading, long, like cold start times, uh, but then maybe run very fast. The way that you schedule these and the way that you manage the auto scaling and the running of these models uh, is very different and requires a different approach than, again, traditional software. So what are some of the challenges that we've seen? Uh, we'll go through a couple of these, but today, deploying ML is economically and technically challenging. There's not a clear path. There's not a standard way that if I you know, took a survey here of three people in the room, all three would probably have different answers about how they're deploying their machine learning. And a couple of the things that go into that that I've been saying you know, <laughs> in this talk, lack of process, lack of uh, you know, thinking about this in a structured way. Uh, it's easy to get you know, there's, there's, it's easy to get proofs of concept. Uh, there's a lot of labs out there. There's a lot of uh, companies exploring machine learning. Uh, the question is, what do you do after that? What is, what is the life cycle of it? You know, who is responsible? And from a technological point of view, how is that managed? Uh, so there's lack of proper champions. Again, going back to, you know, who is responsible? Who, uh, you know, for which parts of the life cycle? This becomes pretty clear in other types of software. Um, you know, I mean, even just the title DevOps uh, is a relatively recent term that's been introduced as people figure out that it's not just blanket software engineering. There's different disciplines within this, and there's different expertise that you want to build up in those areas. Uh, and then there's, there's certainly plenty of opportunity for improved technology. Uh, like I said, a lot of the tools that have been built up uh, over the years for deploying and managing software could be focused more on the, the task of machine learning. Uh, I think there's a huge greenfield opportunity here to ask yourselves, uh, if you're entrepreneurial-minded or whatever, uh, you know, 
how can I take a tool that's been invaluable to software developers in some other context and just ask how, what would that look like if I wanted to really fine tune it in order to be applicable to machine learning? Uh, other kind of big takeaways that we've, we've seen over time, uh, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Um, this is a, another common pitfall that we see people, companies fall into. Uh, they will decide, you know, rather than using something off the shelf or, or using existing technology, they'll say, hey, we can probably just build that. Maybe repurposing some of our existing deployment infrastructure, or, um, you know, in many cases, there's, there's going to be a team of engineers who just say, that sounds really cool and fun to build. Like, we'll go do that. Um, but, you know, we've seen plenty of examples of companies that spend months, and in many cases, years going down this road only to have the project end in failure or not really end up where they want. Unless you're one of the, you know, really biggest companies in the world, uh, you know, trying to build your own, you know, from scratch machine learning infrastructure is probably not the way to go. Uh, you know, there's, there's other considerations, looking out for lock, vendor lock-in, there's, there's some giant cloud solutions, things like that. Uh, there's trade-offs in those, just as there is with anything. Um, and, you know, ultimately, you know, don't try to be perfect, you know, trying to, you know, get improvements where you can and make it, again, an iterative process uh, and try to make that feedback cycle as tight as possible. Uh, so if there's one major takeaway from this talk, uh, I think I, I've, you know, really emphasized a lot, but you know, machine learning is not the same as production machine learning. If you don't get production, uh, then it's just a science experiment, and you know, we need to get value out of these things in order to sustain all the, the, the amazing growth that we've seen in the industry. Uh, and we don't need to do this from scratch, though. We don't need to be, you know, it is greenfield, but we're not operating in the dark. Uh, it's still a field of software engineering, and there's a lot of lessons that have been learned. There's entire institutes dedicated to, you know, what are the best practices? What are the best tools? What are the best, you know, infrastructure options for software engineering? We can take a lot of those lessons and apply them to our field, and it can make our life as machine learning uh, experts a lot better. Uh, so that's what that that's uh, that's what I got. Um, there's some more uh, things to, to read. The Google paper is really great. Uh, you know, I also recommend some of these articles. Uh, if you have any more questions, I'll I'll take a few now. Also, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, info at Algorithmia you can get in touch with me that way. Uh, and if you have any questions about uh, production and machine learning, uh, that's uh, that's what we do at Algorithmia. So, thank you. And uh, I do have uh, one question about uh, the model uh, management and uh, versioning. So for example, when we work on, let's say, a uh, Java program and uh, we build an artifact, uh, we use something like a, uh, like a central like a repository, like a Nexus like artifactory to manage uh, the artifact we build and version it. And so for the model we build, no matter due to like data updates or code updates, so how do you like manage the model? What are your recommendation for the tools to manage the model? Yeah, uh, I mean, that, so I definitely think it's important to have, I, I think there's a lot of benefits to having a central model repository, uh, if, if I'm understanding your question. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to just, you know, sell algorithmia. That is a big part of what we started as, though, is, is a central place to uh, archive and make discoverable uh, the work that's being done. We see a lot of reinventing the wheel at companies. Uh, and you know sometimes it, it's things like you know feature uh, and you know feature extraction from the data or just processing pre-processing data in order to be more useful. Uh, in other cases, uh, yeah. Uh, well, in, in other cases, it's things like word to vec uh, and word vectorization. You know, this is something that you know if you have. 10 teams doing data science in a company, they're often re-implementing this 10 times. And I think that there's a lot of benefits that you get from having that in one place. Uh, there, there's a bunch of options for, for how to approach that. Uh, you, you, do you have any like open source solution to recommend? Uh, I don't know any open source off the top of my head. But. OK, okay thank you. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for a great presentation. Uh, have you, uh, would you like to mention open standards for predictive model deployment, such as PMML, PFA, Onyx? Yeah, I, I would love to see a lot more progress on that. 
Um, we really, I mean, you know, there, there's a couple really good open source model formats that are starting to get attention. Uh, Onyx is a good one, PNL is a good one. Uh, and I would love to see more of that. The biggest challenge that I've seen with that is that in, with rare exceptions, those model uh, serialization formats are not enough yet. You still need to wrap them with Python code or, or whatever kind of code to do things like processing the input in order to just get it into a matrix form uh, so that you can actually use an Onyx model. Uh, so one thing I, I just, you know, personal crusade that I'm on is I would love to see model files that include every, the entire thing, the entire transformation of the input into the model and then the, back into the output format that you would want to use. Um, Thank you. I believe there is a lot of opportunity for open source contributions, especially to Onyx. So if anybody is interested, please join Onyx project. Thank you. Yeah, big supporter of that. So yeah, thank you. Hey, um, it, it seems to me that it's kind of challenging to reconcile the difference between, uh, you know, there's, there's this tooling gap and don't build it yourself and don't reinvent the wheel and don't get locked into a vendor. What it, do you have any examples of something that kind of threads the needle properly or where you've seen uh, the balance properly allocated between those extremes? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, I think you're hitting on it, right? There's a spectrum of options. Uh, you know, there's the full cloud provider lock-in, SageMaker, things like that. Uh, you know, there's full open source plus some rolling it of yourself. Uh, you know, again, kind of selfishly, uh, Algorithmia, I think, tries to thread that needle in the sense that we're multi-cloud, we can deploy to AWS, we can deploy to Azure, we can deploy to VMware. Uh, so that gives a lot of flexibility in that sense. Um, so, I mean, I think over a long period of time, the open source uh, infrastructure tools, like, will we'll get there. Uh, and for the time being, I think that, you know, they, even though they're advancing really quickly, the, they still fall short. It takes a long time for open source software to get enterprise ready. Uh, so that, that's, that's part of, that's kind of our thesis uh, of kind of how we're positioning ourselves. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. Got it, thanks. <laughs> Question about uh, production side of uh, your deployment. Uh, so model can drift very fast. Uh, so what is your recommendation? How to monitor, how to set maybe thresholds, uh, you know, to go back to rebuilding code? Uh, yeah, I think that that depends a lot on the problem domain more than anything. Um, I mean, we see people wanting to do retraining or, 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 you know, monitoring on an hourly basis, on a daily basis. Uh, but there's probably many situations where it doesn't need to be that frequent. Um, you know, you could get away with monthly or weekly or yearly in some cases. Uh, I think daily is probably the most common, um, you know, sort of period to, to run tests and, and reevaluate models. And often uh, concurrently with retraining, which, again, I feel like daily is what I see the most commonly, just anecdotally. Uh, should be retraining an automatic in this case. Uh, sorry, what do you mean? Uh, so basically, you have model um, which deployed, uh, but you can build another block which train models in parallel and deploy it automatically. So is it way to go, or it should be human intervention? Uh, you know, again, I'm going to say it probably is, is fairly uh, vertical specific. It depends on the use case. Um, I mean, I think that, it, it, you know, it also depends. Do you have labeled data? Do you have unlabeled data? Uh, you know, wh when can you do the retraining? Um, you, you know, the, the example that he mentioned of, of, uh, of wine. Uh, so, you know, I built a model. I trained it on, on the images. Uh, but, you know, if... A user, you know, we send a, rec a user takes a picture and we send a recommendation. We don't necessarily know what the correct label for that is on a nightly basis. We might need to, you know, send that over to Mechanical Turk, and so it might be on its own schedule. I don't think that there's sort of a, a blanket rule for that. Yeah, so, so la labeling can be a human intervention, actually, in this case. In many cases, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so it should be b background to make it production, uh, sort of several business uh, analysts combined with data scientists who labeling in time to make it production, really production. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure I understood the question. Uh, so so uh, it looks like to make it really production, it should be whole team working to prepare data to update models in time. Otherwise, model drifting, and you don't have resources to uh, update model. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the, the challenge of cleaning the data and maintaining the data doesn't end when, you, when you're done your first round of training. I mean, that, that's an ongoing process for sure. And, uh, you know, hopefully you can detect that automatically in some cases using model diff detection and accuracy detection. But uh, I, I do agree that it's something that you need to be proactive about. Um, hi. Um, I have a quick question more related to the people who are currently studying everything related to machine learning, AI, and how we can start incorporating this mentality of DevOps since the very beginning. And I'm asking this because, yes, I'm studying uh, things related to machine learning, but I've never been exposed to projects related to something in deployment. Um, in your opinion, what is, what is a good initiative that universities, um, educational institutions can pursue in order to bring these two things together because I've, I've seen this void and I really don't know how to, how to you know, uh, how, to, yeah. how to work towards no, that. I, that's a really good question and it's something I think about a lot. I mean, you know, the, it's actually kind of funny that I, I was doing a PhD in AI and machine learning and not once did somebody even mention Git. Like, nobody even mentioned source control. Like, nobody thought about, like, you know, how you run it or how you actually get it, you know, in the, in the real world. And that was honestly one of the things that frustrated me when I was back in academia was just this, this like, the chasm between the work that people are doing in machine learning and, and pushing the state of the art and, and building these models, but not actually getting them into the hands of people and companies and projects that could really benefit from them. Uh, and that's why I'm, one of the reasons why I'm technically on a leave of absence from academia right now, because, uh, you know, that, that's one of the reasons we built Algorithmia was, you know, how can we, uh, you know, get this work, this great work that's being done into the hands of more people. Um, so I think that there's a lot that universities could be doing. I mean, it, it's tricky because a university is meant to be a place of, of pure learning and, you know, it's not just about the applications and the use cases. Um, but I do think that there could be a lot more crossover from, you know, the software engineering institutes with, you know, the rest of the CS departments. Um, you know, in, at Carnegie Mellon, actually, the software engineering institute was completely separate college from computer science and all that. And uh, I, I think that that's a lost opportunity to, to have that separation. Are there any good industry practices for when you don't have ground truth? Uh, sorry, say again? Um, are there any good industry practices when you don't have ground truth available to you? Uh, you mean like you don't even have the data labeled? To, to yeah, so you with? don't have a target available. So uh, we deploy a lot of reinforcement learning apps. Um, so and we are working towards explainable RL. So there's a lot of use cases where we don't have access to ground truth. So I was wondering what are some of the things that you guys use? Yeah, so that's something I didn't really have time to get into as much in the talk. And I kind of focused on some of the more simple of the machine learning use cases, things like vision and natural language processing. Uh, reinforcement learning and, and some of the things of that nature uh, have an even different you know, life cycle on their own. Um, and so they, they require thinking about in uh, kind of different ways. Um, you know, I think that there's the, the, the basic thesis of, you know, how can we add more best practices to it still applies, though, even in that world. Um, you know, best practices like, you know, snapshotting versions of the model as it's going and, uh, you know, keeping track of those. And, and in many cases, even, you know, using things like semantic versioning, which doesn't always translate totally cleanly, but, you know, just or just having snapshots of, of the, the reinforcement as it's going uh, is something I think you can, again, look to traditional software and see examples of how that's been done before. And I think that there could be a lot of uh, interesting opportunities there if uh, somebody wanted to explore. All right, thank you. Thank you.